All right, any questions from last time? You guys all just get to talk about the birds and the bees? <laughs> very good, very good. I didn't. I mean, Professor Kaplan had to explain all that to me, too. I had no idea how, how this stuff works. So. I had two kids, too, so it was very strange. Um, okay, so we were talking about therapeutic drug monitoring. Wait, what, what is that? Monitoring drugs, therapeutic. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm aware. What does that mean, though? Yeah, so we're, we're looking at drugs with small therapeutic indexes, right, indices. How do we monitor those drugs, though? So we're looking between, like, toxicity and efficacy. What do we measure, though? We look at trough levels, we look at peak levels. How do we get that? What? You draw blood. There you go. Perfect. Right. So you're doing <laughs> blood monitoring. You're doing blood samples to get a level, right? And so depending on the type of drug you're dealing with, maybe you're looking for a peak, sometimes a trough, right? And again, there's always a therapeutic range associated with this because if there isn't one, you just get a random level and you don't know what it means. What can you do with that? Nothing, right? And you should never order anything that you don't know what you're going to do with the results, right? Or if a lab result's not going to actually change your management, there's no point in ordering it in the first place, right? So anyway, so what are the steps how you actually do therapeutic drug monitoring for these patients here. So um, again, the question is, are you just doing like a routine monitoring, which isn't usually recommended unless there's been some change in the patient, physiologically speaking, or if you have a specific indication, right? So if the patient is uh, having a lack of response at what you would think to be a normal therapeutic dose, or maybe they're having side effects at a good therapeutic dose, you can get a level and kind of figure out what's going on. Now, good blood sample collection is very important. That's where documentation is incredibly important, right? So again, was it done at the right time? Who can say, right? So for, uh, very frequently, and we just had an instance of this not too long ago, uh, we measure blood levels of the drug called vancomycin. Anyone remember what that drug does? Antibiotic. It's pretty heavy duty antibiotic. It's a great, yeah, it kills MRSA essentially. That's um, so what we use it for in a lot of cases. And so you have to measure trough levels for vancomycin, right? To make sure it's in the right therapeutic range to kill off that MRSA. And so what happens is, is if the nurse draws it at the wrong time, guess what happens to it? Well, if she draws it too early, then the level looks falsely high or low, do you think? It looks falsely high, right? So again, if you imagine like your dosing interval, and again, I apologize for having to put you through my uh, drawing, but imagine if you have your dosing interval, say this is a 12 hour period, and normally you're supposed to get that level, that trough level right there. And so imagine like your IV dose kind of goes something like this. This would be your trough level. If you end up drawing it too early, then yeah, you're right. You think the level is too high, and then you might think to do what? Either decrease the dose or more frequently do what? Decrease the frequency or, or increase the interval, essentially, right? So instead of giving Q12, maybe I do Q24 instead, right? But again, knowing the timing is really important. So assuming the nursing documented the time appropriately, because that's generally who's going to be getting most of your labs, um, you're going to find that that will be able to kind of tell you, um, was it too early, was it not, right? And also in conjunction with knowing what time the lab was drawn, what else do you need to know? Yeah, when the dose was actually given, right? So you need to know at this point here as well, so that way you can kind of correlate it to whenever that trough was done to make sure, okay, was this an eight-hour level? Was it a 12-hour level? What was it, right? Um, the right collection tube is really important as well. So if you guys seen different types of like lab collection tubes, green tops and purple tops and tiger tops and all kinds of different tops, right? It's not like bathing suit tops, but what do you, what do you think is the difference between those? Well, they're useful for measuring different labs. And so an example of this is that they are, there are some that are lithiated. Anyone know what lithiated means? It contains lithium, right? So if I were to accidentally draw a lithium level on a patient who it was inappropriately put into a lithiated tube, guess what it looked like? It looked extremely high, right? And I'd be like, oh man, this patient should be really toxic, but maybe they're having no side effects. That would be sort of an error, a lab error, like a blood collection issue um, that needs to be uh, accounted for, right? So sometimes you have to play detective a little bit when labs come back and they look wrong, right? You kind of get a feeling like this seems off somehow. You need to do that investigation to kind of figure out what happened with it. So there can be cases there. Sometimes the tubes are heparinized. You know what heparin does? It's an anticoagulant, right? It thins the blood. So what do you think it's going to do if I was measuring, um, say, the blood's ability to clot and I put it into a heparinized tube? It looked like it was it was uh, it wasn't clotting fast enough, right? It looked anticoagulated when it maybe not that may not be the case. So a lot of different uh, issues that will come up. You'll learn about these as we go forward. 
again, looking at the laboratory measurements, making sure that the labs are, are appropriately, um, you know, being calibrated and all these different things. I mean, the lab make mistakes sometimes, right? Sometimes the machines just aren't running correctly and that's things um, that they should be communicating out to you. Uh, and then finally, that communication of results, right? Um, they tell you what the result is, whether it's high, low, or in between. Um, and also it's really important to keep your unit straight. And that's something I'll probably be harping on until you graduate um, is, is getting your unit straight. So if I ask you, you know, what's the level of this drug and you say 50, I'm probably gonna say 50 what, right? Is it micrograms per ml? Is it milligrams per deciliter? Is it milliequivalents per liter? It's important to keep those straight because you can get into trouble. And I, did I tell you the aspirin example? I probably mentioned it, but you might've forgotten it already, but that's okay. <laughs> when I'm on call, for, oh, yes, ma'am. No, I probably won't have you do that conversion because clinically you don't really need to that that frequently. It's very rare that you'd have to do that, especially when you work at one place. Um, generally, their lab is going to be reporting things out at a very consistent manner, and so you don't really have to think about it. But let me give an example of when I'm on call for the poison center. Um, I take call for basically all the hospitals in the panhandle, basically down uh, just north of Orlando, right? So there's a lot of different hospitals that we deal with that might be calling up for a poison patient, right? And so I had one patient who had an aspirin overdose calling me for an aspirin overdose and just to give an example a normal therapeutic level of aspirin is somewhere between 15 and 30 milligrams per deciliter once you start to get like 40 50 60 they get kind of toxic at that point once they get up to around 80 90 100 they're could you know they could basically die if they don't get proper treatment right so this uh this hospital is calling up and they say oh yeah the patient's aspirin level came back it's 400 and the nurse didn't sound very concerned about it when she said that. And I was just like, um, what? And they're like, no, it's, it's 400. And I say, well, how's the patient doing? And are they dead? And they said, nope, they're still alive. They're doing, they're doing okay. And I said, well, that seems very odd. What were the units on that? And they said micrograms per ml. When you convert that to milligrams per deciliter, it turned out to be 40. 40 is much less concerning than 400, right? But you have to take that step back to be like, okay, well, this lab seems off. What is it with that? And then you have to do that work to figure out, okay, well, actually, it's a normal... It's a super therapeutic level, but not scary super therapeutic as compared to 400, which that patient would be dead, right? So anyway, so again, once you get those levels back, then you have to kind of consider what are we, what are we going to do with this, right? So not only just taking a level into account, you have to also look at the patient as well, right? So how are they doing? Are they getting better clinically? Are they having toxicities? You know, what's going on there? You know, if I get a level back for, say, a, an antibiotic, and it's slightly lower than what I would like it to, but the patient's white count is improving, their fever's coming down, clinically they're looking better. Do I need to do anything with that level necessarily? Sometimes no, sometimes that level would be sufficient for that particular patient, right? Because again, sometimes you're gonna have outliers. People may respond at different levels outside of that normal therapeutic range. That's one thing you wanna take into account. So again, always treat the what? The patient, not the number, right, exactly. Um, so then once you take that into account, kind of looking at the patient sort of holistically, then you can look at your optimization of the drug treatment. Typically, you'll either be modifying the dose of the drug, you'll be modifying the interval, or in some cases, you may be doing both. Typically, I like to do one or the other because if you do both at the same time, your tendency to over or undershoot tends to be greater, right? Um, so if I were to say, for instance, change the dose of a drug, say change it from say 500 to 250, and then I extend the interval out from Q12 to uh, say Q24, I'm more likely to undershoot what I'm looking for in terms of levels there, okay? So generally go with one or the other in most cases. And we'll give you some examples of how we, how we can do that going forward. And then basically once you make that change, what do you do at that point? We can do it all over again, right? So again, you can basically, what do I have to wait for the patient to get to before I check another level? Steady state, right? Absolutely. You want to make sure your patients are at steady state before you check that next level. And how long does that take? Four to five half-lives, right? So you have to know what the half-lives of the drugs are to understand when to get that level, right? So for instance, with vancomycin, I usually have to wait until the third or fourth dose before their steady state, and then I can check a level, and I know it should be accurate. Yes, ma'am? What is the difference between trough and steady state? Because in fun labs, they say what you would. Actually, I was not there for that one. Um, they said, like, check it at trough level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I will tell you the exact thing right now. So let me draw it out for you. So again, imagine if you're dosing a drug. Um, remember, uh, you know, basically time is going to be our x-axis concentration on the y here. And so remember when you're dosing a drug, you know, eventually you're going to have this kind of stepwise approach here until you basically get to steady state, right? So again, you have this kind of nice sine wave sort of vacillation, right? That's the average. So your average steady state concentration is that point. Again, it looks like I'm going to the DTs when I'm drawing this, but you get the point. Um, 
basically what you find that average concentration that's the steady state level right that's your average steady state concentration there now remember when you dose it like that when you're dosing intermittently there's going to be peaks and valleys associated with it and so for instance for certain drugs i may be looking to get a certain peak for other drugs i may want to make sure i get a certain trough it's very going to be drug dependent so as an example for vancomycin i'm usually looking at trough levels I can go into why that is, but that's going to take me about 30 minutes, and that's going to be safe for pharmacology one next semester. We'll get all into antibiotics, and you'll learn why we do troughs for some drugs, why we do peaks for others, uh, and it'll make much more sense there. So, again, I'm trying to, like, keep you guys interested, so it's like a cliffhanger until next semester, right? Wow. You guys are captive audience, so you're coming back anyway, but I at least want to, like, leave some kind, of, some kind of breadcrumbs there. But, yeah, so there is a difference between a trough level and that steady state level, but the thing is, is if I'm checking a trough here at this point, what am I going to do prematurely? It's going to look too low, and I'm probably going to increase my dose. I'm going to decrease the interval. I'm going to do something that's going to end up overshooting it when I get to that new steady state. So that's kind of the difference between the two, if that makes sense. Anyway, so we'll get into more detail on like why we do trials for certain drugs and others later on. So, Okay, so um, looking in terms of things like pharmacogenetics and therapeutic drug monitoring, typically... TDM is more of a reactive sort of thing, right? We start a patient on a dose we think is going to be appropriate. We get the levels back once they're at steady state, and then we react to it, right? So it'd be nice if we could do things prospectively, right? So we can decide based off patient characteristics, how can we adjust this beforehand to ensure that instead of saying, that, okay, well, every patient I have is going to get the same starter dose. Well, if I have a patient that's of this ethnicity, maybe I start at this dose, or if I have a patient that has um, this sort of genetic profile, I'm going to start at this dose, right? And then that is, again, a way to do it prospectively um, based Based off of the pharmacogenetics, right? And so again, looking at this, you can see if you're dealing with just kind of a random population of patients here, you know, you don't know who are going to be the, the over-responders, the under-responders, or maybe the non-responders, right? And so by looking at things like pharmacogenetics, in some cases we can do specific tests for different polymorphisms to see if they're going to be a bad candidate for a drug, and maybe we'll forego the drug altogether. But the goal here is to try to single out these people to say, well, you're going to be a good candidate versus not. Uh, I'll give you an example of one for warfarin, right? We said warfarin does what? It's an anticoagulant, right? So again, if I'm giving it to someone who needs warfarin and they don't have enough of it around, what happens? They have clots, right? And they can get a stroke or... PE or whatever the case may be, right? So that's the bad thing if they don't get enough warfarin. If they get too much warfarin, what happens? They bleed and they can have a stroke and they can die, right? So, or they can bleed anywhere for that matter. But so the point is, if I can find people who have specific polymorphisms or specific genetic traits that make them bad candidates for warfarin because of the metabolism or because of other features there, then I can say, well, maybe this is a bad drug for you. Or maybe I can start off at a smaller dose because I know you're not going to metabolize it as well and you're going to get sort of an exaggerated effect. Again, for certain drugs, we have tests we can do for that. And as time goes on, we'll probably get more of them as we go forward. There's certain drugs that we don't want to give to patients if they have a specific polymorphism because they're very likely to have an anaphylactic reaction, right? So I will go into those examples later. But just know that there are some times where you want to do testing beforehand to see if the patients need to have an adjusted dose or just forget the drug altogether. And again, instead of, you know, say nowadays when you start a patient off on a drug, you have no idea if they're going to respond well to it or not, right? So imagine um, with the antidepressants, right? It's very difficult to know, is the patient going to respond well to this antidepressant versus this one? They work very similar to one another, so it's hard to tell. Um, and so again, usually you're trying different trials. Okay, well, sertraline didn't work well for you. Now let's try switching over to, uh, you know, uh, citalopram. You know, let's try switching over to this drug and this drug. And you keep going kind of in this very circuitous kind of method until you find the right drug for that patient, the right dose for that patient. However, in the future, hopefully, we'll have better tests where we can basically go through and figure out, okay, well, you know, based off of this trait that you have, you're more likely to respond well to this drug, right? Now, you guys are familiar with, like, 23andMe, yeah. right? What is that? Genetic. Basically, genetic testing, right? They'll tell you things. And one of the things they test for, which I haven't had it done, but um, one of the things I hear on the, on the ads, right, um, is that you can get the trait tested for to see how you metabolize caffeine, right? They tell you, are you a slow metabolizer or a fast metabolizer? Why do you think that would be important, say, for PA students? If you're a fast metabolizer, what does your caffeine consumption need to do? To, you'd have to increase, right? I need more caffeine to get the same effects as I would for someone who is, uh, say, a normal metabolizer. If you're a slow metabolizer, what happens? You probably want to dial back your dose. Or if you see someone who is very sensitive to the effects of caffeine, they may be a slow metabolizer. They just get more bang for their buck because their enzymes don't work quite as fast as someone else's, right? I probably have uh, the, the metabolism of an elephant when it comes to caffeine because it really doesn't do anything for me anymore. I'm just maintaining normal at this point, you know? <laughs>
the anywho, point being though is that you could do tests for different drugs and kind of find out the same thing. Like find out is this drug good for this patient or bad for this patient, and that can lead you to trying to uh, instead of having to go and try four different drug trials, just go to right straight to the, the right one. Right. So that can be nice from a time saving standpoint. So let's go through an example of a case um, where therapeutic drug monitoring is utilized, and we'll see kind of at different steps what could be influencing the case. And again, I have to kind of be a, a little bit of a detective in order to kind of parse these things out. So let's go ahead and talk about digoxin. Now, digoxin, anyone know what that drug does? For the heart, yep, it's an antiarrhythmic. Um, we use it for, in some cases, for AFib, but more than likely than not, we'll use it for CHF in a lot of cases. So it's a very old drug. It's been around for a long time. However, it does have a very narrow therapeutic index. If you look at the therapeutic range between 0.5 and 2 nanograms per ml, very, very small doses you're dealing with, like you know, 0.125 micrograms or milligrams is a normal dose for that. So very small amounts you're dealing with. But let's say we have a patient who comes in. Um, they were on this dose for 15 days, and they come into clinic, and they appear to be doing well clinically. Um, but they come in, their plasma concentration is 3.4. Okay, so first off, just looking at that, what do you think? Too high, too low, normal? It looks too high, right? And so, on again, on a test, I would, because you guys have a test coming up, right? <laughs> so, yes. Um, you have a lot of tests probably coming up, but you have my test specifically coming up. And you're going to find that I will generally put the therapeutic range on there as well. So the patient comes in with this level, here's the therapeutic range. I do that because I'm not so, um, you know, in, I'm not so interested in you guys memorizing all the levels. What I am interested in is your interpretation of levels and being able to do something with that level, right? That's a more important thing for you as PAs. So looking at this, okay, what are some possible reasons why the patient may have an elevated level? Okay, maybe they're a slow metabolizer, right? So this would be important to know how does the body handle digoxin, right? You need to know, does it get metabolized? If so, what enzymes do that? What kind of elimination pathways does it go through? Does it go through renal elimination, right? These are the, this is why you need to be able to find the kinetics to determine how does the dose change for these patients here? I think my mic might be going out soon, but anyway, what are some other reasons why they may have an elevated concentration? She may have just taken it, right? So again, you would like to ask when the last dose was given. Would be one question. What else? Extra dose. Maybe they took an extra dose, right? As elderly patients get more elderly, what happens to their cognition and their memory? Usually goes down, right? So it's very frequent. You get people accidentally take double doses. They get calls like that all the time at the poison center. They're like, oh my goodness, I thought I forgot. I thought I took my meds for the day, and then I went ahead and I, I forgot that I did, and I took another dose. What do I do now? You get those calls all the time. What other reasons? Hmm? Okay, maybe something could be influencing the absorption of it. Maybe they're eating with something that increases absorption, right? So they have a higher level, potentially. What else? Okay, like you guys are all kind of going down the right pathways in terms of trying to... Because, again, just like you have a patient comes in with a complaint of, say, belly pain, you work through a differential. And this is the same thing here. It's no different. You try to come up with a differential for why that level might be high and what you can do about it. So questions you want to ask. When was the dose taken? Okay. When was the blood drawn in relation to that, right? So again, usually they're in the clinic, you know, they might have gone to Quest and had their levels done, who knows when, but you want to find out that information. Um, what's the dosing regimen? Have there been any changes to it? You, as say, for instance, the family practice person, they come to you, who's likely dosing their digoxin? If it's a heart med, probably their cardiologist, right? So again, you may find that even though the bottle says take one tablet twice a day, perhaps the cardiologist says, hey, you're supposed to be taking half a tab twice a day. And they change that. The bottle doesn't change, but the patient's instructions have. That happens pretty frequently. And again, you have to ask a patient to know that. Um, are they getting any adverse effects? Now it's, uh, you, have, you have to know what the adverse effects of digoxin are to even know if the patient's having it, right? Because again, a lot of times patients may not recognize adverse effects as being related to the drugs that they're taking, right? So for instance, I'll never forget, I was in pharmacy school at the time, and I really didn't know anything about drugs. Um, I was, you know, like the first year of pharmacy school, like you really don't learn a ton about drugs. And so... Um, it's all pathophys and biochemistry and all that kind of stuff. But I remember I was at the, the YMCA. It was local in town. I remember going there, and I don't know if you guys know, like, the general clientele of the YMCA. It's a lot of old dudes hanging out, <laughs> particularly in the, in the locker room. Yeah. And general clothing is considered optional <laughs> by the majority of them. <laughs> so anyway, so as I'm trying as hard as I can to avoid my gaze, um, I could hear... <laughs> conversations going on. I remember this one guy, he's probably like, you know, 89,000 years old, and he was talking to his buddy, and he was saying, yeah, like, you know, I'm taking this heart, heart pill, and, you know, I'm just starting to see these weird yellow, like, halos around lights and stuff. I was like, that's really weird sounding. Like, I wonder what the heck that is, right? And at the time, I had no idea, but now that I thought back to it, I was like, wait a second, he's having digoxin toxicity. 
this guy was experiencing something called xanthopsia, where you actually have a yellow with a vision, and they get these kind of yellow-green halos around lights. It's a very unique thing to dioxins. When you hear that, you have to be able to key in on that sort of stuff. You know, but you have to know to ask the question, right? To be like, hey, are you having any kind of visual changes? Do you notice anything weird when you look at fluorescent lights? Things like that. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Well, fantastic, right? So again, you guys are being very exhaustive in terms of asking your questions. Um, but again, but again, it's that yellow greenish sort of coloration that's kind of the unique thing with Jijox in there. But anyway, so these are why you ask these kind of questions here, right? You want to cast a very broad net so that way you can capture as much as you can and try to link it back to whatever may be causing your patient's issues, right? So anywho, so remember that when you're looking at steady state concentrations, right, and again, you want to assume this patient is at steady state, um, you have to look at things like the bioavailability and the dose, right? So questions, have these factors changed to cause this levels, uh, the patient's level to go up? And then on the bottom here on the denominator, you're looking at the clearance and the dosing interval, right? Remember, if we were to, say, decrease that dosing interval and give the drug more frequently, what is that going to do to our CSS? It's going to go up, right? Americans are giving it more frequently. That number, that dosing interval goes from, say, 12 to 8. And that makes our denominator smaller. That means CSS is going to go up in those cases, right? So keep these relationships in mind. So the question is, all right, the bioavailability. Is the patient absorbing more drug than usual? There's not a whole lot of things that actually do this. In some cases, you may find certain things like fatty foods may increase drug absorption. But for the most part, this isn't going to be a concern. The bigger concern would be if you had a low level and you were looking for something that would be decreasing the bioavailability of the drug, right? So if they had like a food interaction or a drug interaction that was causing that jujox not to be absorbed appropriately. That could be the case, but with a high level, it's usually not bioavailability. Um, is the patient taking more than prescribed, right? So look at cognitive issues, who's giving them the medications, if not themselves, um, had the dosing instructions changed recently, things like that. You want to inquire about those sorts of things. On the clearance side, this is really, really important, especially for elderly patients, is to see has the clearance changed. In, predict, in particular, what sort of organ function are you looking at for that? Kidneys are number one, and then also you want to look at liver function as well, because that have an effect on clearance additionally, right? Um, and so again, renal function can vacillate for patients. They get dehydrated, can go down. They get sick, and can go down, or just naturally, it's going to go down over time. And so again, if he started this dose back in 1998, and now it's 2019, no one's actually ever gone back and readdressed it, like his renal function may have gone down, right? It could be different than when it was before, and that level may not be, that dose may not be appropriate anymore. And then again, the dosing interval, it kind of goes back to the dose and taking drugs appropriately. Now, if you ask a patient, are you taking the drug like you're supposed to? What do they say? Yes. Absolutely. What's a better way to ask about how they take their medications? Or you might tell me how you take your medication, right? Have them teach back to you how they actually do it. Like, okay, well, I wake up at 9 o'clock, and I take it then, and I take it at 10 o'clock at night, whatever the case may be. And you can capture a lot of things like that um, when I was having them actually tell you, describe how they actually do it, right? So other things, you know, could the error or could the assay actually be wrong? Quite possibly. There's actually um, interesting cases where critically ill patients, if you imagine patients in the ICU, they can actually produce proteins that look enough like digoxin that actually will flag a level. Uh, so we can have patients who are on digoxin who look the levels too high when actually it's just their bodies producing these things that will trip the assay uh, inappropriately. Probably not an issue in this patient here, but sometimes there are assay errors. And then also, are there interfering substances, right? So is there anything, maybe a drug-drug interaction, drug-herbal interaction that could be causing levels to go up here? So these are all things you'd be looking into. And again, depending on the drug, you're looking for different things potentially. So now what do you want to do? So one, you want to confirm the sample timing. Make sure it was done appropriately. So find out when the dose was given last, when the lab was drawn, and usually that's going to be like on the report out from the lab or from Quest or wherever you get it from. And then you want to determine patient adherence, right? So how do you do that? So question on the board, how in-depth are your test questions going to be? Do we need to worry about all the clinical correlations given? Of course you should. Every single one of them you should know. No. Um, so I'm going to try to finish up this material today in a good chunk of uh, the next section. Um, we will have a Kahoot review tomorrow. You guys are familiar with Kahoot? I'll have you know I was the trendsetter. I was the first one to use Kahoot here. So <laughs> not trying to brag, just saying. We'll have a Kahoot review. You also find mine are probably the best, so whatever. Um, just kidding. We'll do a Kahoot review. That'll give you an idea what kind of what type of uh, things to focus on, what kind of test questions we're looking for. Again, this is a very conceptual sort of class, right? We're not we're not really in all the nitty gritty. If we talk about a specific drug, I will go into I will tell you exactly what you need to know about that drug on the test question to answer it, right? As long as you know these concepts and definitions and whatnot, okay? 
right? You can do the basic sort of math on the scratch paper. You're, you're going to be totally fine. Um, but we'll get more to that later on. There is a, uh, a last eighth section that I believe I posted about the autonomic nervous system. That is something new I was going to do for this class. Um, because I'm not teaching physio this year, um, I think that is a section that is really critical to understand the way that a lot of drugs work in terms of side effects and therapeutic effects. There's no questions on the test regarding that. So if we don't get to it, I'm probably going to make a supplemental video, which will be posted and you can watch that at your leisure. I recommend watching it before you start farm one if you would like to, because it will help you get at least a little bit of a head start in remembering, oh wait, what does the sympathetic nervous system do? How does that interact with my beta blockers? What does a you know a parasympathetic system do? How do drugs interact with that, et cetera? <laughs> okay, so I may we'll see what we get to today and then tomorrow morning, right? Can I answer your question a little bit? Probably not. The coot will be much more um, uh, telling from that standpoint. Anywho. Getting back to this, right, so we were talking about, um, you know, what do you do once you have this level back? You try to confirm the timing of everything, when the dose was given, when the level was drawn, etc. cetera. Um, and again, you're looking for that adherence to the, to the medication. You're looking for concomitant substances that might be affecting uh, the drug itself, right? So there may be other herbal supplements on board that are inhibiting or uh, enhancing the effects of metabolism and, and the effects of the drug. Um, other medications, other cardiac drugs may be affecting this. And then the question is, well, if you're really not sure if that level was true or not, you can always repeat the level, right? You can always re get a repeat and see if it comes back normal, right? Maybe the first one was a was just wrong, right? Could have been just incorrect, depending on if the sample wasn't used appropriately. Like sometimes samples have to be kept on ice after they're taken out of the patient, otherwise they can read incorrectly. You know, different things like that could, could be um, something to consider. And then again, we can also determine our bioavailability and clearance based off of things like renal function, hepatic function, etc., to determine is the patient not clearing the drugs like they should. So, um, and again, with this one, do we have the explicit criteria? You know, uh, this was a patient who had a recent dose change. It's been two weeks, and now we're checking a level. That's pretty appropriate for the most part because, again, when you have an aerotherapeutic index drug, anytime you change a dose, you typically want to go back and actually check a level to make sure that your change didn't over or undershoot the, the therapeutic range there, right? And again, looking at timing, and then, of course, we have to have that rational interpretation of that level. So, um, again, in this case here, for digoxin therapeutic drug monitoring, other reasons why we might want to go ahead and check a level would be if we suspected toxicity, right? So they came in complaining of nausea, vomiting, and they were seeing those halos around lights. That would be a very good indication to go ahead and check it. Or if they came in and their blood pressure was, you know, 80 over 50 and they felt really dizzy all the time, that would be another good reason to check it. But you have to know what the side effects of that drug are in order to get an idea to go ahead and check it, right? Um, if you just started treatment, it's another good reason to go ahead and get a level once you're at steady state. Don't do it too soon. Um, and then again, if you have a patient with renal instability or clearance issues, you also want to go and check in on them. So for instance, if you're rounding on the ICU and you notice your patient's urine output has dropped pretty precipitously or say their creatinine uh, went up, say by 50%, that's usually a pretty good indication that renal function has changed. You want to go ahead and go ahead and get that level to see if the levels change with it because that could be the case there, right? And again, sometimes you just have high-risk patients. You just want to be extra careful and check the level. That could be an indication. So uh, other things, if you suspect there's an interaction, it could be a case there. Suspected overdose, right? Sometimes patients don't intentionally overdose. Sometimes they could have an accidental thing where they take extra doses or if their renal function is declining, they can overdose themselves inadvertently that way as well. Yes, ma'am? Um, not necessarily, right? So, for instance, if I change the dose, then they're not necessarily, not necessarily going to have symptoms that I would need to check a level for. But if they come in complaining of anything, and I think it's related to the digoxin, then yes, I would go ahead and check it at that point, right? Um, and again, look for other things like you know changes in the pharmacokinetics, usually due to physiologic changes. And then again, if I want to decide future therapy, right? So if I'm dosing a patient and they're not really getting any benefits from it. I check a level and it's therapeutic, and that patient may just not be a good responder to it, and I may just decide to stop the drug altogether, right? Versus if they were subtherapeutic, well, of course it's not working because the level's not high enough to do the job it's looking for, right? So, again, when we're interpreting these concentrations here, is the drug a steady state? What was the sample timing? Are the patients being adherent? You know, look at the sample collection, the tube that it was placed in, all these different things. I look at the blood sampling site. Sometimes we'll have uh, nurses who will draw a blood level out of the line that the drug is infusing into. So when the level comes back and it's like 10 times higher than what you would expect it to be, it'd be like, was this going in the same line? And they're just like, oh, whoops. Okay, well, now I gotta get another level, cost more money, et cetera. Um, and just remember, there's interpatient variations, right? Just because someone is a little high or a little low doesn't mean you have to jump to treat that, right? You don't have to change anything if they're not having any issues and it's being therapeutic. 
So reasons why um, a level might not make sense, right? You get that kind of feeling in the back of your neck and you're like, this level just doesn't look right. Well, some reasons for that. One, uh, it could be the, the wrong dose was given. Now, why might, say you're in the hospital, why could a wrong dose be given? So documentation could be one thing, but more likely than not, someone made a mistake along the way, right? So for instance, um, are pharmacists completely foolproof and human error proof? No, we're not. <laughs> I had to tell you, we make mistakes just like you guys will and just like the nurses will and just like everyone else will, right? So everyone makes mistakes here. So there could be an issue where an incorrect dilution was made. Um, you know, we have pharmacy technicians who are not necessarily as well trained as the pharmacists are that do a lot of the drug preparation that is checked by a pharmacist. But not everyone has the same level of diligence and looking at that stuff as others. Some stuff slips by sometimes. So there could be an issue there, right? Maybe the nurse went to the machine, the, the drug dispensing machine, and pulled out two tablets instead of one on accident, right? There could be a lot of reasons why a wrong dose is given there. Um, some cases, if a level looks low and it looks oddly low for whatever reason, even though it looks like the patient's getting their doses, um, sometimes doses get skipped, right? Or maybe an infusion gets held. Imagine if you have a patient who's in the hospital and they need to go down for, say, imaging, right? They need to go down for a CT scan or MRI or something. Um, they may be down there for a long period of time and they don't get that dose of drug. So by the time they get the level done later on, it looks low because basically the patient's starting from scratch all over again. You have to wait for steady state to happen again, et cetera. Um, so these are things why you want to look at the documentation to see where the patient's been, where they're going, et cetera. Um, and sometimes this happens actually more often than you might think. Either the drug will be, um, the dose will be given at the wrong time, and then the level's done at the right time, which inherently makes it wrong, or the dose will be given at the correct time, but then the blood is drawn at the wrong time. And again, if the nurse is not documenting things appropriately and they're not actually marking down the time, because, you know, if you screwed something up, you might be like, oh, maybe I'll just mark down when I was supposed to have done it. And that would be fine, right? It's not good practice, but sometimes people do that. Um, so those are the things you have to try to interpret with a, with a bit of a grain of salt, right? Make sure you can find that. Make sure to talk to your nurses, find out the documentation is correct. Okay. Other things, um, as I mentioned, if the sample is taken through the administration line, it's going to come back high. That's just how it's going to be. So if it looks like extremely, extremely high, patients not having any issues, check the what line the actual uh, sample is taken from. Um, what happens if the sample is taken from the wrong patient? Does that ever happen? 100%, right? Remember I talked about the twins, like you put baby A into baby the B bed, and then you put baby B in the A bed. People can screw that stuff up all the time, right? Again, we have things like barcoding that helps us with that, but if they forget to barcode scan, then that may not happen there. So things like that can happen. Um, you know, sample handling issues, if it's supposed to be kept on ice and it's not, it's kept at room temperature, you know, that can affect the results or just the wrong collection tube as I've kind of already alluded to. So a lot of reasons why things can get screwed up. Uh, factors related to the kinetics. Now, again, some patients will fall outside of the population averages. Remember, when you look up stuff in Lexicomp to see what the half-life of a drug is, that is based off population averages. And again, not everyone is average. Some people are going to be outliers and they'll fall outside of that. Um, so just just because someone is a little bit different on the outlier doesn't mean that that's drug is wrong for them. It just may mean you need to adjust it a little bit to, to make sure that um, you're interpreting those levels appropriately. Uh, make sure studies, study state levels are being used there. And then um, actually one thing that's unique to a few drugs, but in particular to Joxin, they actually have what we call a, a distribution phase. So sometimes when drug um, levels are drawn too early, drugs tend to be in what we call this distribution phase, where it's kind of like sitting there in the circulation. It takes a couple of hours for it to actually partition out into the tissues for its kind of like final sort of resting sort of steady state. And certain drugs do this, like lithium is one that does this because it takes a little bit of time to get into the tissues. Digoxin does this. And so because it's sitting there in the serum, if I draw a level at that time, what did the level look like? A little too high, right? So you have to be aware that some drugs have a distribution phase, and sometimes you have to wait six hours after a dose before it looks accurate at that point. What's interesting in a distribution phase in bioavailability? So bioavailability is just kind of the ultimate amount that gets into the circulation, right? Versus bio, uh, the, the actual distribution is when it gets into that circulation and then distributes out to the tissues, right? So again, digoxin may have a very good bioavailability to get into the system, but then it takes a little bit of time for it to actually partition out into those tissues there. It depends on the half-life of the drug, and it depends on the how many doses were missed, right? So, for instance, if you were to have a patient who was taking it, you know, and they were kind of on to the point where they're actually on their steady state, right? They're kind of hanging out on steady state, and they just miss a single dose, but then you kind of get them back on track. 
you know, it probably won't make that big of a difference, right? Versus they miss like an entire day's worth and they kind of plummeted down to zero, then yeah, you would have to start all over again at that point. So that would be very drug and situation dependent on, on that. So good, good question now. All right. Anyway, so getting back to this distribution phase, um, or oh, actually other things that can happen here. Um, one, could the wrong drug be assayed? So unfortunately, you're going to find that a lot of drugs sound alike and they look alike in terms of their names. Um, so you may say, hey, I want this kind of level, but they'll mishear it and maybe get a different type of level. Or for instance, different drugs within the same class could accidentally be assayed. So as an example, uh, the aminoglycosides, which I've already mentioned gentamicin before, there's two other ones that fall into that category we use pretty commonly. There's tobramycin and there's amicacin. And so if someone were to accidentally say, hey, get an amino glycoside level, the patient's receiving tobramycin, but you measure gentamicin, it's going to come back zero, right? Because again, that's not the blood, uh, the drug that's actually in the patient's blood. That's an error that rarely occurs, but can happen. Um, you sometimes endogenous substances can interfere with the assay. So that's what I mentioned with like, those critically ill patients. Sometimes they produce proteins that look like digoxin to the assay. You can falsely raise it. Uh, and then, of course, looking at things like storage techniques, et cetera, and then just technical errors of the assay. Sometimes labs screw things up. Sometimes the machines go down, et cetera. You just have to be aware of that. Okay, so looking at the case resolution, so digoxin, as I mentioned, has that six to eight hour distribution phase. And so if you check it too early, you're going to find that the level looks too high. So in this case here, you would ask the questions, when was the dose given? When was the level taken? And it would turn out that the patient had taken it two hours prior to the sampling. They took their dose and two hours later, they got the sample done. So that could be a good reason why the level would look too high. So what would you do at that point? And wait and then repeat the sample, right? So I wait till they get past that distribution phase, recheck it, and then it comes back 1.1, right? And if you remember, that was back within that therapeutic range. So ultimately, what action is needed? Nothing, right? So again, frequently, the best thing to do is to do nothing, right? Sometimes the smartest thing you can do, just sit back and just chill out and not do anything, right? So just be aware of that. Not every level that is abnormal needs to be treated necessarily. Sometimes by doing that clinical investigation, you can figure out that, wait a second, actually it's inappropriate. We should go ahead and just check another level and then you're, then you're good to go. So, um, so anyway, so that's therapeutic drug monitoring. We'll get into more detail on that when it gets into specific situations, right? So ideally, we would use drugs that never need to have therapeutic drug monitoring done on them, right? We'd like to use drugs that just have a wide, nice wide therapeutic index and it doesn't matter. However, there are some instances where you just have to, right? Warfarin, uh, you know, digoxin, amino glycosides, vancomycin, these are drugs you use day in and day out that you just have to do this uh, sort of monitoring for because in a lot of cases, they may just be the best drug for that patient there, right? So any questions on that section? If not, we'll move on to the next one. And so this section is going to be the last one for test material, just FYI. So one through seven is going to be all your test material. The last eighth one, again, is just going to be sort of the, the, the autonomic cherry on top of the pie. Anyway, or ice cream, wherever you put cherries at. Okay, so let's talk about uh, actually designing dosage regimens for your patients, right? So this is a little bit more practical sort of application of what we learn. Now, when I say rational prescribing, what does that mean, do you think? actually using your noodle when you're actually prescribing, right? You're not just saying, you come in, you got a runny nose, here's a Z-Pack, here you go, buddy. Is that rational? That would be irrational prescribing. You're not going to be irrational prescribers, are you? Of course not. You're all going to be very, very rational. Um, and of course, once you make your diagnosis, right? So that's the hard part, getting your diagnosis. And then you got to figure out how to treat the patient. And so, again, you have a lot of different options there, right? Maybe surgery is right for your patient. Maybe radiation is. Um, very frequently, though, what is the right treatment? Well, yes, nothing might be, but uh, more, more near and dear to my heart, drugs, right? So, again, very likely patients are going to get a prescription in a lot of cases, right? Because, again, if you were to be, if you were sick and you went in to see the doctor or the PA or the nurse practitioner or anyone, uh, and they said, hey, I know you're sick, we're not going to do anything for you. You're going to feel a little gypped, right? You're like, well, that was a waste of money. Why did I pay that copay for nothing? That's why a lot of people get prescriptions, because they at least feel like they got something out of the whole interaction there. Now, that's not always right, but that is a uh, sometimes going to be an expectation of your patients there, right? So, um, again, we'll train you how to be the, you know, the, the how to lead with an iron fist and be like, no, you have a virus, no antibiotics for you, right? We'll talk about things like that. But most of the time, patients end up getting a script for something. 
So, and again, um, when a patient visits the office, about 67% of the time, two thirds of the time, they're probably gonna get something written for it. Um, and again, at least an average of one script per visit there in a lot of cases, especially as you get older, you're just more likely to develop those more and more disease states, you're gonna get something there. And so what you need to figure out is you kind of your stepwise approach to making sure you're rationally prescribing patients, um, you know, making sure that you kind of thought through every pathway to make sure you come to the right decision in terms of the dose, the drug you're using, et cetera, right? So the first one here, Make your specific diagnosis. Um, again, patients want you to do something because they want to feel like they're getting their money's worth by coming to see you. Um, and again, you find that those prescriptions oftentimes get written to satisfy your patients. Like you ever have, like you ever, anyone ever worked like customer service before back in the day? Like and you ever just have that one customer that comes by, you're just like, I don't even care. You just take whatever you want. Just get out of here. <laughs> That will persist into your medical career, I hate to tell you. You're going to deal with people like that. Um, but that leads to things like unnecessary cost, right? The patient, they get a script they don't really need. It means they're filling out the pharmacy. It's an unnecessary cost. Um, if you give out too many antibiotics, guess what happens? Antibiotics stop working. And then we have super bugs that are going to take over Earth, right? So if it's not nuclear winter, it's probably going to be the super bugs that get us, right? They can have more adverse drug reactions, which can sometimes be worse than the actual disease state they might have been dealing with in the first place, right? And so to know what to prescribe them, you have to have your diagnosis, right? You have to understand um, what you're doing. So for this example, let's say we have a patient who has probable rheumatoid arthritis. Now, how many of you know how to treat rheumatoid arthritis? Good, because you're gonna learn that you know, in the following semesters. But let's go ahead and start off with you know, saying, okay, we have this tentative diagnosis here, right? So you wanna share it with the patient, tell them why you think that based off clinical exam, based off of labs, et cetera. So you have to consider what the pathophysiologic uh, actual implications of the disease state is actually causing, right? So to know how to treat it, you have to know what the disease is doing itself, which is why having a good physio background is so important. That leads right into pathophys, right? So you have to understand how the body works normally to know how it can go wrong, essentially, and then you learn how to treat it. So you have to understand the disorder, know how things like rheumatoid arthritis differs pathophysiologically from osteoarthritis, right? Because again, the treatment will differ based off the different pathophysiology. And again, where do you find this stuff out? Well, again, this is where you look up your guidelines. You can look up textbooks. You're going to learn this in class. You have lots of information available to you. Then you want to figure out what your objective is. And so you may have multiple goals depending on what the actual disease state that you're dealing with is. And so as an example for rheumatoid arthritis, I know it's an inflammatory process. And so how would I deal with that inflammation? Well, I give them anti-inflammatories, right? So I can do things like trying to deal with the pain associated with the inflammation. And then I can also try to arrest that course of the disease to make sure that the patient maybe retains function of their, their joints for longer, right? Make sure that their hands stay functional for longer over the long term. I come up with specific goals and then I figure out how to treat with the medications for those particular goals. Next, you're going to select a drug of choice. And so how do you figure out, like, so you have just a plethora of different drugs. Some of them may be doing the same thing. How do you figure out what the drug of choice is? You may, may, may look at costs. That's a good thing. What else might you look at? Allergies could be guiding you to determine what your drug of choice is. Huh? Efficacy. How do you know which one's the most efficacious? Okay, maybe which one's causes least toxicity? Truth is, you're going to be going by your resources, right? So oftentimes what you're going to do, your gut instinct, when you see something you don't know, is to look up. At, what do you look up? Do you look up out of date? You look up up to date, right? Usually, again, that's just what a lot of people do. And I tell you, even when you're actually practicing, you're still going to look up up to date all the time. So for instance, you can look at that. You can look up textbooks. You can look up all sorts of different resources. Oftentimes guidelines will tell you, right? So again, if I'm dealing with an infectious disease process, well, why don't I go to the Infectious Disease Society of America? They have guidelines to tell you exactly what to use for the majority of patients, right? And again, that can help you determine what your drug of choice is. But again, take into all, to account all these other things, the cost of it, the uh, allergies, the patient's age, other medications they're on that could be interacting there. These are all gonna be factoring into it. So as an example, with, R, uh, with RA, with rheumatoid arthritis, um, we use a lot of NSAIDs to treat these patients, right? There's non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, right? There's things like your ibuprofens and naproxens. Well, does the patient have an issue of, say, aspirin intolerance or, say, GI ulcers? Well, NSAIDs aren't really good for that set of patients there because it can actually aggravate and give you a stomach ulcer, right? So maybe that would lead me to choosing a different set of drugs than just an NSAID, right? Um, as I mentioned, it's cost a major issue. What kind of insurance do they have? What will cover it? Um, now, is there any way to get like cheap medications? Like say, if you go to a pharmacy? Sometimes, yeah. If you can go to like, say for Publix or Walmart or anywhere else, like there usually is like a free or cheap drug list, right? Why do they do that? Why do they just give drugs away for free? There's like, hey, it's gonna be 45 minutes for me to fill 
this prescription. Why don't you go around, go get yourself a pub sub, maybe pick up some some milk, you know. Okay, so it's that, uh, that loss-leading kind of um, mentality that says, okay, you're going to go spend 100 bucks on Publix groceries for his $4 medication. Like, it ultimately ends up working out for their benefit, right? So, again, there's usually some business incentives there. But it's nice for the patients because ultimately you can get some cheap or free medications in, in some cases, right? But these are things to think about. Um, you know, what about compliance? You know, is once daily drug dosing really important, right? Is there are there more likely to be non-compliant if you have a really complicated regimen? Probably. So if we can get it more simple, it's going to be better for our patient. Next, you want to figure out what the drug dosing regimen is going to be. So oftentimes, this is determined by the kinetics of the drug itself, right? So we have to think about things like the organ function of the patient. You know, what's their liver doing? What are their kidneys doing? Do I need to adjust the frequency or, say, for instance, the dose in order to account for this, right? So again, this is why it's really important for a lot of drugs to look up the renal dose adjustments to make sure that maybe instead of giving it every 8 hours, I give it every 12 hours or every 24 hours, whatever the case may be. And then, you know, what is the patient going to be willing to tolerate? If you say, hey, you have to take this drug six times a day, they're probably going to look at you and do what? Yeah. Like, nah, that's not going to happen, right? Or they may say, yes, I'm going to do that, and then it doesn't happen anyway. So, again, think about the compliance of it, what they're actually going to be likely to, to hang with. Next, you have to figure out how you're going to monitor um, the, the effect of the drug itself. And you basically have to determine, like, an endpoint, right? So, for instance, you know, you may say if you're treating a uh, bacterial infection, what's your endpoint? clear the infection, right? Or for instance, when dealing with pain, like perhaps I can't get rid of all the pain, but maybe I can say get you down from say an eight out of 10 pain to maybe a four out of 10. Maybe that's going to be considered to be a success. And so you get to talk about that with your patient to figure out, okay, what are we monitoring for both in terms of efficacy, but also what are side effects you have to look for? What are things that are going to be kind of warning signs that you should stop taking the drug altogether for, right? There are different things you have to educate on. So as an example, um, say for instance, uh, I was giving uh, an NSAID to a patient and I wanted to warn them about the issue. They could have a GI ulcer, right? So what are some things that could be indicative of having a GI ulcer? Anyone know? Abdominal pain, right? Black tarry stools, what is that indicative of? Upper GI bleed, right? They have hematemesis. Like, there could be a lot of different things you would warn them about. Because, again, you want to let them know what the common side effects are, but also let them know what the killer side effects are. It's stuff that if you see this, if you see blood... Or if you see black tarry stool, like perhaps you should stop taking it and go into the ER. Right? They have to let them know this thing, even if it is rare for it to occur, right? Or, you know, for instance, you know, when you have a patient who you're giving a course of antibiotics, you say, hey, take this for 10 days straight, and they feel better by day four or five, what are they going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop taking it. I feel better. I'm going to hold on to it for next time, right? Not appropriate, right? Why do I need to take the full course? You gotta get rid of all the bacteria, otherwise you may find you're selecting out for resistant bugs that come back and then that antibiotic does not work anymore, potentially, right? Things that, this is why I have to educate these patients on this stuff. Also, um, think about education, right? So usually there's different resources out there to help educate your patients, especially if you're using anything that has like a, um, a unique dosage delivery device. Uh, if you're talking about like an inhaler, you know, training patients on how to use that stuff, it's really, really important. Think about things like age barriers, right? So if it's a little kid, they may not really be um, uh, cognizant enough to really kind of handle uh, you know, how to use medications and how to use um, things like inhalers and whatnot. However, you may find some kids are super savvy with this stuff. So as an example, um, we'll have these type 1 diabetic kids who will have a, an implanted pump, an insulin pump. And I've seen like eight, nine-year-olds that can dose their insulin for their diabetes better than I ever could, right? Because they're quite savvy with this stuff and they've kind of been living with it long enough to kind of know what's up. Um, not everyone's like that, unfortunately. So you have to kind of be, be cognizant of your patient. Think about things like language barriers. You know, you might have patients who are coming in and they speak German and they only speak German. That could be a problem, right? So what do you do? You say Guten Tag first and then you <laughs> find the translation services, right? Or usually you'll have some kind of resources that can help you with that, that sort of thing there. Worst comes to worst, Google Translate maybe that can help out. Who knows? Uh, but like Spanish is huge around here, right? So again, having access to Spanish resources is invaluable when you're working, especially in this, this part of Florida. Also educational barriers. You know, um, think about how you describe how drugs work to patients of varying levels of education, right? If you're talking to someone who's a physician, like, they're going to understand this stuff. If you're talking to someone who maybe only has a middle school education, and you're saying, um, you know, why is it important for them to finish the antibiotics? Think about tailoring that to what their educational level was, uh, will allow them to understand. And then always make sure you use uh, educational materials. So as an example, here's a drug called Diastat. Diastat is, um, the generic name is called diazepam. Valium is another name for this drug as well. So most people probably heard of Valium before, right? It's an anti-seizure medication. And this is actually a rectally administered anti-seizure drug, right? Now, why, why do you think we need these rectally administered 
anti-seizure medications. All right, if you're actively seizing, you can't really swallow anything, right? You're more likely to choke on it and aspirate. Um, so because of that, and again, do you think the patients themselves are administering this? No, they're actively seizing. They're not going to be giving themselves anything. So you have to train the parents or the caregivers in order to say, okay, here's how you actually give this. Now, imagine, I don't know if any of you have children, but imagine if your child was having a seizure all of a sudden in front of you, do you think you're thinking calm, cool, and collected? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and use this diastat, right? I'm going to go ahead and, and think about all the steps. To use. No, you're going to be freaking out, right? So you have to think about educating them beforehand so they can react with a little bit more uh, grace under pressure there. So there's an example where this diastat, usually this will be do, uh, dialed into the right dose coming from the pharmacy, but little things like, it comes with a lubrication pack. You have to make sure that you tip the end of the, the uh, rectally administered portion into the lubrication because otherwise you can cause rectal trauma. If you're freaking out and you're not thinking things through, you might forget that step if no one had educated you on it. Okay, So little things like that. You have to make sure that patients are educated. Give them. There's all kinds of resources online. You can get through Lexicomp, through the manufacturer's websites. They'll have lots of stuff that can help you. Uh, with like pictorial examples as well, it can be really uh, handy for people who may not have a lot of education or maybe illiterate, different things like that. And then um, the other thing is, as well, is like, you know, pharmacists are supposed to be providing patient education. But, um, you know, if you're working at Walgreens and you have 350 scripts you're filling a day, do you have a lot of time to sit there with each individual patient and talk to them? Yeah, that's what usually like you find the pharmacists. They're probably not very um, we're kind of antisocial people in the first place. I don't know if you've noticed. Um, <laughs> But um, we're, we're not super talky people. We're usually the more introverted types. But um, a lot of times we're super busy too. And so you may not have uh, the luxury to sit down and actually go through all this with the patient. They should do it, but may not always do it. And so uh, don't just take it for granted that someone else is going to explain this stuff to your patient. Really take the time to do it yourself. So let's go through an example of rational prescribing. Let's say, for instance, we have a three-year-old patient that comes in with left ear pain, has a fever of 101.3, and cough and runny nose. And then you go ahead and take a look with your otoscope and you see that. You're like, normal, not normal? Not normal. Not normal right? It looks pretty, pretty inflamed there, right? So you make the specific diagnosis of acute otitis media, right? So again, you're starting to think back now. Okay, well, what's the likely bacteria? Uh, what's the pathophysiology here? What is exactly causing this acute otitis media, right? So you have to think, was well, it viral? Is it bacterial? What things most likely? You'll get into that in CMS when we're talking about farm, different things like that, and figure out, okay, well, do I think it's bacterial, viral? That will ultimately decide how you're going to treat that, right? So let's say I'm going to go through and, okay, well, I know what the main causes of acute otitis media tend to be bacterial. I know it's going to be things like uh, strep pneumo. I know it's going to be things like H influenza. And so that was going to guide me because knowing the bacteria that causes the infection helps me to decide what? What antibiotics I'm going to use for it, right? So again, you're going to find that a UTI is going to get treated differently than otitis media, differently than meningitis, because different bacteria causes infections, thus you need different antibiotics to treat those bacteria. So anyway, and again, you don't have to know this stuff specifically right now. We'll get into it next semester, but again, just for the example's sake. So again, what could be a problem? What if I use like an inappropriate antibiotic and I use one that's so broad spectrum, it basically kills everything? It's too, big, too broad of a brush you're painting with there. You don't need all that extra coverage, and so that leads to a lot of resistance, right? So um, people are familiar with the drug Levaquin or say Cipro. Right, those are called fluoroquinolones, and those were super easy because you can give them to anyone with bacterial sinusitis. You give them for pneumonia, and we just gave it for everything, right? And guess what? Now we have a very hard time using a lot of those fluoroquinolones because most people have developed resistances to those. That's a whole class of drugs you can't really use that well anymore because of all the resistance you're dealing with. So it can be a big issue there. And again, um, again, provide that information. If you think it's bacterial, say, okay, this is why I'm using this antibiotic because it should be able to kill with the bacteria that I think is causing this infection. Or if you really think it's a viral, here's why I'm not giving an antibiotic because it would be inappropriate, et cetera. And again, trying to figure out, okay, well, how do I educate on this kind of stuff? What do I figure out what kind of the, um, the, the implications are of the pathophysiology? There's lots of resources out there, right? So for instance, here's the CDC. Again, I don't know if you guys trust the government or not, but I usually find the CDC to be pretty reputable. Um, you can find lots of information, right? Both tailored for the patient and tailored for the provider to help you decide, well, how am I going to be treating this, right? And I wanted to figure out what my objectives are, okay? So this patient's coming in, they're having a lot of ear pain. I know they're infected. Um, so my goals are going to be, one, to treat the actual bacterial infection, right? So what's going to do that? antibiotics, right? So I have a, a specific drug for the goal I'm trying to achieve. And then I want to treat the sequelae of the disease, mainly going to be that inflammation, right? And especially that fever they had, 101.3. So what could I use for that? Tylenol, ibuprofen, right? Different anti-inflammatories, right? So again, you may be telling, here's why I'm using these different drugs. This one is for the fever. This one is for the bacteria, right? Uh, et cetera. 
Next, you're figuring out your drug of choice. Looking into it, you got to figure out what your drug of choice is based off the age of the patient, uh, their organ function, the allergies, right? Someone comes in with a penicillin allergy that can really throw a monkey wrench into the works, if, trying to figure out what antibiotic to use for them, right? Also, a lot of times you want to figure out what they've been on previously. What do you think that's important? Yeah, so you have, you have kids that have a recurrent otitis media. They've been receiving amoxicillin three or four times now, and they're wondering why it doesn't work anymore. Well, now you probably select it out for more resistant bugs, right? Of course, it's not going to work anymore. So, and, and again, know your resources to find the appropriate medications there. I'll give you some examples here. Um, as I mentioned, you know, LexiComp is a very important one um, that you'll use here, mainly because that's the one I use mostly, and it's through up to date, so you have easy access to it through your library. Um, there's another good one through the uh, the Nova Library called uh, Clinical Pharmacology. That's another good one that I think they're they're a little bit more sort of. Um, you know, if you if you looked at LexiComp already, you'll see it's like very terse, kind of like here's just the information you need. Clinical pharmacology is a little more verbose, and you get a little bit more kind of background on some of the stuff there. That's another good one. But depending on where you work, they'll pay for a subscription to a different service, and so it just depends on where you're working at. Um, but also consider different uh, specific indication or specific resources for whatever you're treating. So an example, the Sanford Guide. Anyone ever heard of the Sanford Guide? It's a really good guide for antibiotic use. We'll talk about it next semester. But basically, uh, it comes out every year, and it has these really great tables that show you, okay, if I'm dealing with meningitis, here's the most likely bugs, and here's how I'm going to treat it. Easy as pie, right? Um, there's also one called the Red Book that is specifically for pediatric infectious disease. Um, again, know your resources depending on where you're working and who you're dealing with. And then you want to know about the, the practice guidelines. So, for instance, if I'm dealing with infectious disease, well, there's probably a society dedicated just to that process, right? If I'm dealing with... Um, ob guide guess what? There's a whole organization dedicated just to that, and they put out practice guidelines that help you decide how best to treat your patients. So, for instance, here we have both the IDSA, which is the Infectious Disease Society of America, and we also have the AAP, which is the American Academy of Pediatrics. They also put out some uh, common um, infectious disease uh, guidelines for, for those patients. So, now, again, how am I going to be selecting my, my drug of choice? Well, how often is the drug given? And then specifically for kids, like how does it actually come, right? So if it only comes in tablets, is that going to be very useful for me in a pediatric patient? No, they're probably not going to be able to take tablets. So does it come as a liquid suspension? That's some, something to know. And then how much does it cost? You know, as I mentioned, there's free antibiotic options that are out there, which you'll learn about, you know, depending on where you work at. And that will can be going into the, the thing as well. Also, how palatable is the medication? What does that mean? How good does it taste? Is it nasty cherry flavored or is it delicious grape flavored? Who knows, right? Um, <laughs> and again, a lot of times pharmacies will provide that service so they can actually flavor it as well. Not every drug can be flavored, but they can say, let's make a pina colada flavored <laughs> amoxicillin. I don't know, like whatever kids are into nowadays. <laughs> can you make it taste like purple drink? That would be fantastic. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Um, if you don't know what that is, don't don't Google it, please. <laughs> Trying to keep you, I'm trying to keep you all pure as long as I can. <laughs> so anyway, looking at the the dosage regimen here. So here's an example. Here's from the guidelines on how to treat acute otitis media. Again, there's a whole guideline just for this indication here. So looking at this, uh, it'll tell you specifically. Okay, recommended first line treatment. Okay, I'm going to use amoxicillin. 80 to 90 milligrams per kilo per day in two divided doses, right? This is very similar to how in the prescription assignment, if you look at that, again, I tell you very specifically, you treat 50 milligrams per kilo once daily for 10 days, whatever the case may be. Um, and then they give you alternatives, right? That's the important thing to remember as well. You know, find this especially like in CMS and, and doing your OSCEs and things like that. It's to know what the go-to drug is, but also have one in your back pocket as an alternative. Because if someone's allergic to penicillins, then this knocks out both of these drugs here. I have to use an alternative, right? Septonir. Or, and again, we'll get into the different types of antibiotics later on, but just know uh, it's always good to have a backup in your pocket of like, what else can I use if the patient cannot receive the initial drug of choice, right? So anyway, so I decided to go ahead and use 90 milligrams per kilo per day of amoxicillin. Remember now, can I just write that on the script and then be done with it? Now you got to figure out the volume that you actually want the patient to receive, especially when you're doing uh, with liquid medications there. Comes as a 400 per five, the patient weighs 20 kilos. Well, how many mLs are they going to need per dose? You guys remember how to do this? Hopefully. Let's figure it out, right? So how do we do this? What's the first step I want to do? So, yeah, I'm actually going to start out. I'm going to start off with saying 20 times 90, right? So 20 times 90. What does that turn into? Oh, my mouse is not working. This is actually the paper not doing this, not me. What does that turn into? 1800, yeah. 1800 milligrams per day, right? 
So how many is that per dose? Yeah, remember because it's divided twice daily. Remember, you look for that divided twice daily or divided three times daily or whatever. If you see divided, it means you got to divide it, right? So how many, how many milligrams per dose are they receiving? So 900, right? 900 milligrams per dose. Now what do I do? Divide by 80. Why 80? Because that's simplification of the, of the suspension. Right, so always convert those suspensions down into the per ml amount, right? So 400 milligrams for 5 mLs, and why do I use 5 mLs? That's teaspoons, right? So again, this is kind of old nomenclature. Let's convert it over into milligrams per mL, which turns into what? 80, right? 80 milligrams per mL. So I'm going to take that 900 divided by 80, and what do you get? Nine hundred divided by 80, and we got the right answer? Perfect, 11.25 mLs, right? That's mLs per dose. Now, this is a little more complicated than I would get on the actual test in terms of the numbers. I usually give you more round numbers to deal with, so you don't have to, like, sit there and divide 900 by 80, right? It'd be more like 500 by 25 or something. You know, I'd make it a little bit more more straightforward uh, for your purposes. But, um, so this is 11.25. Do I just say 11.25 mLs twice a day? <laughs> you could. You could write that on there. It may be difficult to actually measure that. So what could I do instead? Round up or down, what do you think? I'd probably round down, right? Again, within 10%, you're generally pretty good to go. So I'd probably round down to 11. 11 mLs PO twice daily, right? And then you have to consider for how long, I mean, 10 days, whatever the case may be, but it's a bit based off the guidelines as well, right? Again, remember how to do those equations there. Um, again, this gives you the exact same calculations we just did because I forgot I put this slide here. <laughs> Anywho. Um, now we got to figure out, okay, well, how do we monitor for the efficacy of the drug itself, right? So, again, warn them of the side effect. What do you think is a common side effect of antibiotics? Maybe yeast infection, stomach upset, diarrhea. You can't really go wrong saying nausea, vomit, and diarrhea, right? Almost every drug is going to cause that. But specifically antibiotics because they can kind of mess up your normal gut flora, right? So you can see, uh, you know, diarrhea associated with this. Um, you know, always be aware you may have a very low chance, but you could be allergic to it, right? It could be an anaphylactic reaction. Very low chances could happen, though. Um, and again, explain the rationale for why do you need to use this for the full course, right? In terms of resistance issues, <laughs> things like that. Because, uh, again, people may want to be economical and save drug for later. A lot of times those suspensions that we give you, once we reconstitute it, they're only good for so long, maybe two weeks or something like that. So if they tried to take it later, the actual drug would be destroyed. It wouldn't even be there anymore and be ineffective, right? And again, you also want to let them know what constitute a treatment failure, right? So again, if it's been three or four days and not getting any better, have them come back to see you because again, they may have a resistant bug. They may need something a little bit bigger, bigger guns in terms of antibiotics. Because do we typically culture otitis medias? I actually find that we don't normally, right? Let's say I have maybe tubes and you can actually get some of the, the drainage. Um, but normally we don't. So in those cases there, you're kind of going off of empiric recommendations. And if they're not getting better on one antibiotic, then you got to switch it up to something a little bit uh, a little bit heftier in terms of coverage. And again, we'll talk more about that later on. Okay. And then, of course, again, coming up with the education points here. How do you educate them based on the language barriers, educational barriers, et cetera? Always utilize education materials if you have the ability to. Um, again, you can print off patient handouts from, uh, from LexiConf. You can print them out from lots of different sources. Okay. So any questions on the rational prescribing? Again, I know you guys are very rational people. You've done that anyway. But again, I want to at least kind of lay it out step by step in, in that process there. Now getting into the actual prescription writing. Again, this is important for your homework assignment, right? Good to know. So who can write a prescription? <coughs> MD, PA, NP, DOs, podiatrists. There's a lot of, a lot of people, vets. I'll never forget one time I failed this like this, uh, this uh, prescription for Keflex, which is an antibiotic, and it was like the biggest dose I'd ever seen. I was like, what in the world kind of infection are we treating here? And I realized it was for a Burmese mountain dog. So cute, yes, but he's also very sick. <laughs> a little dental infection we were trying to treat there. But a lot of different people, optometrists, you know, a lot of different people can be writing for prescriptions, right? And so, again, a prescription can not just go to the pharmacy, but it could be a lab prescription, could be uh, for imaging, could be for lots of different things, right? So remember that there are competing state and federal laws when it comes to writing prescriptions. In general, what you're going to find is you want to go with whichever one is stricter, okay? 
So if there's more tight limitations on the Florida laws than the federal laws, you should go with the Florida laws, right? That way you kind of keep yourself out of trouble from both the state and the federal sort of standpoint there. Um, typically, if there's nothing addressed in the state law, then you go ahead and follow the federal law. And I'll tell you what these laws are moving forward here. Now, obviously, prescription errors are a huge deal. And so the first thing you should think about is all prescriptions should be legible and unambiguous. You think this is very simple. Is that always the case? No. Anyone here have poor handwriting? I have the worst handwriting. Well, not the worst. I've actually seen some, some pretty bad student handwriting. But um, maybe one of you will take the cake. I have no idea. But a lot of people have very bad handwriting, and so that can lead to some issues. Now, we've kind of getting around some of that because a lot of times now things are electronically prescribed. But that's not always the case. You may still find a lot of paper scripts being done there. Um, but you need to make sure that there's enough information to allow whatever healthcare providers are dealing with that um, to, to discover possible errors, make sure they can identify if something kind of weird's going on and something needs to be changed. Now, looking at, I'm not going to make you read the entire statute uh, associated with this stuff, but some of the points I want to make sure you're aware of, and you'll find that most of this is um, laid out in the prescription assignment. So by following that assignment, following that rubric, you're going to be basically doing everything you need to do to stay within the legal limits of the law when writing your scripts, right? This is why I have you practice this basically from the class one on. Um, so looking at this, basic requirements, and these are for non-controlled substances. When I say controlled substance, what does that mean? Please don't say a substance you control. Scheduled drug, these are going to be your narcotics, right? These are going to be things like your painkillers and your sedatives and your opioids and all kind of good stuff, right? We'll talk about those in a little bit. They have a different set of re restrictions. Obviously, those are going to be a little bit tighter controlled than your non-controlled drugs. These are basically anything that is prescription only, but is a non-controlled substance, right? So your blood pressure medication, antibiotics, et cetera, fall into this category here. So one, if it's not typed or written, it has to be legible regardless. Okay, easy enough. Um, you have to include the name of the practitioner. So I need to know who specifically is writing the prescription. You have to have the name and the strength of the drug prescribed. Then you have to have brand name on there, generic name. It could be one or the other. Um, some people will, will do both. Uh, I tend to find it is helping. It helps with the uh, the ambiguity if you write both, and helping to limit that ambiguity. That way, I know specifically what you're dealing with, what you're trying to prescribe there. Um, you have to write the quantity of drug to dispense. So, for instance, if a patient's receiving an antibiotic twice daily for 10 days, one tablet twice daily for 10 days, what should be the quantity to dispense? It should be 20 tabs, right? Because they're taking one tab twice a day times 10 days. Two times 10 is 20. All right, so you need to have, make sure you have that dispense quantity there. It needs to match up with what your instructions are. If there's a discrepancy there, guess what it ends up with? You get a phone call, and then you have this nerdy pharmacist going, what are you doing? You gotta fix this. Um, you wanna, I'm trying to teach you how, how to avoid these phone calls as best you can because you don't. You really don't wanna interact with us. Or again, like I said, generally antisocial by nature. You don't want to deal with us. Anyway, other things to know: directions for use. Right? How specifically they are to take the medication? One tab twice a day. Is it take it at nighttime? Take it with meals? Whatever the case may be. This is where you write that. It needs to be dated. Now, can I write for a script for the future? Typically, no. Typically, you're going to write for the day you actually wrote for it. But again, these are things. Um, sometimes you may have prescriptions where you say don't fill until a certain date. But for the most part, you need to write the day that you actually wrote the script itself. That needs to be on there. Okay. And then it needs to be signed by the prescriber uh, on the date that it was actually issued, right? The date it was given to the uh, patient there. Now, again, you don't want to pre sign a bunch of scripts, leave them in your lab coat pocket, and use it later. So it's going to save me time. Well, what if someone stole your prescription pad? Right? They can be bad. Like those prescription pads are a high commodity item because people can write for whatever they want with that stuff, especially if you were to pre-sign them. So don't do that. Now, does it have to be hand-signed? Not for non-controlled substances, right? You can have electronic signatures. You can have stamps. No reason to actually have to sign it yourself. Right? You'll find there's some exceptions to that when you get into controlled substances, but not for these, right? So you could just have the computer print out your name, PAC, and you're good to go, okay? Um, can you, do they have to have an actual paper script they take to the pharmacy? No, they can be faxed in, they can be verbally communicated. If they're called in, the pharmacist has to be the one to actually take that down and they'll write it into a script and they will have that on file, but that can be verbally done, that's no problem. And then as a default, all prescriptions are only good for one year. So you can write, you know, you can say take one tab a day and you can say dispense quantity 30 and then put like 20, 200 refills on there. It's not going to work, right? Because by the end of that year, once it's uh, expired, guess what? 
we're not going to give them anymore. It doesn't matter how many refills you put on there. We're not going to go beyond the one year mark. They'll have to say, hey, you have to go back to your provider, get a new script. Okay. So again, as a default, those are one year. Uh, good. Okay. Now, can you put multiple prescriptions on one paper? Mm -hmm. You write for multiple things on one. Um, again, that will be a rule that gets next when you get into the controlled substances, but yes, you can write for multiples on here. Um, again, make sure there's enough room to legibly write all of them if you need to, or if it's a paper or it's typed, you know, it's a lot easier in that case there. And then um, you're going to find that controlled substances need to be separated, all right? So you don't want to write for a pain med, like a, an oxycodone on the same script as their hypertension med, right? It's a no-go. You need to keep those separated out, which usually isn't going to be a problem, but you can just know that you can uh, combine those two. Okay, so here's an example of what one of these will look like. If you look in your prescription writing rubric, you'll see something very similar. Again, look, you have the name of the provider here along with their address. Notice here, what, why is this useful to have their MPI, DEA, et cetera? I can make sure it's a le legit prescriber, right? So I can actually look this stuff up. For a controlled substance, you're gonna have to have the DEA on there to make sure they're a valid prescriber for that stuff. But um, again, this is helpful, especially when you're looking at like, insurance coverage and things like that. They wanna make sure it's a valid prescriber using this thing. Um, so again, don't just hand out your MPI number willy-nilly to whoever, right? Because then call in as you and give that number and then they basically can call in whatever script you want. Um, you have the address, phone numbers there. You have the name of the patient. Now the address, you notice, was the address required on that list? No, but why is it handy to have the patient's address on there? Could there possibly be more than one Sean C. Martin in the world? Mm hmm. Yep. You ever try to like, look up something like on Facebook and you realize there's like a good, like, how is there, <laughs> how is there a million Bartleby E. Ferdinands in the world? But there's, they're out there, right? The, so because of that, you have more patient identifiers, and that helps you to delineate between these different people. So if you're looking for John Smith, there's probably a million of them in the CVS database. Um, having things like their address, having things like their date of birth will help to delineate that out, and so that way you make sure you get the right patient, right? Because I can guarantee you uh, there's been a lot of errors where um, someone will call it in a script, and they put it onto the wrong patient, and then when the real patient comes in, they're like, well, we've never heard of you before, and that can be a problem, right? Anyway, so again, you don't have to put allergies on there. Sometimes that's handy, especially for the pharmacy. We'll typically ask that of the patient when they come in. And then you have the name of the drug here. Here would be your generic name, followed by the brand name. Again, you don't have to include both of those, but it's usually good practice. Uh, it helps them make it more clear. And you write 500 milligram tablets. This is the strength. When I say you're talking about the, the name and the strength of the dosage form, this is the strength of it, right? So if it's 1,000 milligram tablets, 500, whatever the case may be, do you want to include that? Number just here, this is the dispense quantity. It's the number 100. That means they want you to dispense 100 tablets. Okay. Now, what if a patient want to come in here and write like an extra little zero on the end of that? They could, right? We probably question it because they're like, well, that's way too many for just a month long script. Like, that seems kind of ridiculous, or a three month long script. That seems ridiculous. Um, but again, that's why sometimes it's handy if you to textually write out your dispense quantities and your refills. That helps to get around that, right? You can't really add zeros onto if you textually write out. O-N-E-H-U-N-D-R-E-D, -E -E right? It's, it's uh, going to be less likely to be uh, uh, falsified. And then you have your directions take one daily for control of diabetes. Now notice here, the indication is also not required by the law. I will have you, actually, I require it for your prescription assignments. Why do you think I like to include that? Because you may have like patients using it for different indications and it's good to be able to check is that dose appropriate for that indication you know metformin is not just for diabetes but you can also use it for PCOS there's a couple other conditions you can use it for and so it's good to know that so that way I can make sure it jives with one the met, rest of their medication profile or I can make sure the dosing is appropriate things like that right so it's important to include that I think it's important to include that you may not do it again I'm going to have you I'm going to keep you as strict as possible while you're in school when you get out there on rotations are you going to see everyone else be that strict that's okay though, right? So again, at least I'll show you what the, the, the high bar is and you can kind of go below that as long as you stay within the letter of the law, right? Um, there's, you keep the refills here and then you'd have the signature, right? It doesn't have to be written out, but again, you'll be handwriting all yours so you'll, you'll write it out. Notice your credentials are also really important to keep on there as well. So that way I know it's not just some random Joe Blow writing in this stuff. I know it's a PA or I know it's an MP or whoever's me writing this stuff. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Um, usually what you'll find is that these will have, and again, this is just kind of an example. I just Googled prescription and this one look good. You're right. That is, it seems like a discrepancy. Um, usually if you have like a big practice that has multiple providers, they'll typically have them all listed out at the top and they'll check off which one, um, it was most typically, or, uh, they'll circle it or something like that. But yeah, that would be, that'd be something that maybe of, of concern. If I look down there, it's like, it says, what does it say? 
I don't know, Carrie Barge? I, I, who knows? Um, you know, I'd be like, oh, that seems odd. Why is that not the same there? And that might prompt a call potentially. So good question. Good eye for detail. Uh, now, some common prescribing errors frequently is due to omission of information, as you're going to find in your personal relationships that most of the time arguments come about from poor communication. Most medical errors come about from poor communication as well, as you're going to find out. So things like saying uh, ambiguous statements like resume pre-op meds. Which ones? you got to be specific when you're saying uh, to resume meds because you want to make sure maybe one of those pre-op meds was not appropriate in the post-operative setting, right? Continue present IV fluids. What kind of fluids? How much? For how long? Right? You need to be very specific here. Um, and again, things like, you know, you may fail to discontinue prior med when starting a new one, right? I see a lot of patients who uh, may be on multiple anti-hypertensives uh, because their prescribers say, hey, stop taking this other one, but they never got the signal, and thus they continue both at the same time, right? These are common errors that can occur here. And then um, also if you have uh, patients not – or providers not indicating if it's a short or long-acting form, that can be a big issue as well. So as an example, um, there is a drug called Welbutrin. It's an antidepressant, uh, sometimes used for other things like uh, smoking cessation and, and weight loss, um, but it's a, most commonly an antidepressant. There's uh, an XL formulation and then an SR formulation. XL formulation is Q24 hours. The SR is Q12 hours. They're both Wellbutrin, just XL or SR. So if someone were to do, say, a med rec on a patient coming in the hospital and they just type in Wellbutrin and hit the first one they see, they may not get the right one, right? And so then you as a prescriber may goof it up and either give it two times too often, you know, give it an extra time off in a day, or it may not give it enough, okay? So you have to be careful with that, um, different forms of the drugs there. And then also anytime you write PRN or as needed, you need to indicate what is that as needed for, okay? Just because an opioid is normally used to treat pain, sometimes it's used to treat cough, right? And so you need to write down what it's indicated for. And again, that helps other healthcare providers to figure out what specifically you were thinking about when you wrote that script. Now, uh, other errors come about from poor uh, illegible handwriting. So if you can figure out what that means, good on you. I can't figure that out, right? Even though I've been reading bad handwriting for, for most of my career. Um, most of this has been supplanted by e-prescribing, which is, which is nice, right? But that does not mean um, that you don't have paper scripts still being written that look like that. So be very clear on that sort of stuff. Other type of errors um, that can happen here. So this is important when you're writing these out. I will ding points off of you if you do if you goof this up. So get in the habit of doing it correctly now. Uh, when you are writing, make sure that you're using uh, writing numbers, especially decimal points. Make sure you use leading and trailing zeros appropriately. Okay. What I mean by that is if you were to write point one, that can be frequently misread as one, especially if you're using a pen you're writing quick. You may miss that decimal point. Okay. It's a tenfold overdose. So how do you get around that? 0 0.1, right? So again, if there's, you need to have that leading zero, there's not a whole number in front of that decimal, right? You don't want to include unnecessary zeros after the decimal. So reading 1.0 is 10. Again, it's another tenfold dosing error you can screw up there. Um, so again, if there is nothing after the decimal, just don't put the decimal. You don't need it there, right? Instead of write 2.0, just write 2. That's fine. If it's 2.4, just write 2.4, but there's nothing after the decimal, just forget it, okay? Um, other things, misreading U. Now, normally, U means what? Units, right? But we don't like to just write U anymore because that can be misread as a zero, depending on the handwriting. And so you may have 10 units of insulin. You can get turned into 100 units of insulin if it's misread. And guess what? Now your patient's hypoglycemic. Now they're seizing. It'll, it'll look like a bad provider, right? You don't want to do that. So again, writing out units going to be better. And I'll tell you, you might see out there international units or IU very frequently. For my purposes, you don't have to write out the international. Just write units and typically you're good to go. Other things. Um, micrograms being misread as milligrams. And you may think like, who would ever do this? They look very, very different. Uh, but again, when you talk about handwriting, it can be very uh, ambiguous there. In that case, it's actually a thousand volt overdose. And so again, it's a very, very uh, bad mistake to make there. Um, instead, we like to use MCG. That was a little bit more clear, kind of delineates from, from milligrams, okay? Um, never, ever, ever use QD. I had one student who no matter how many times I dinged her on her prescription assignments and her EOR notes, she always still wrote QD. And I said, why do you keep doing this? I ding you every single time. Could never break the habit of her. You guys aren't going to be like that, though, right? Right, daily, Q day, Q daily, whatever you want. Just don't write QD anymore um, because it would accidentally get misread as something like QID, which is four times a day versus one. And again, it's a big, big medical error there. So just write it out daily. It's just easier. And then uh, some other ones you may see, uh, things like MSO4. Anyone know what MSO4 stands for? SO4 is what? 
sulfate. So MSO4 is actually morphine sulfate. We get mis uh, or we get confused with MgSO4, which is metal gear solid. Oh no, excuse me. Um, it is magnesium sulfate. I don't know if there are any video game players out there, but um, for magnesium sulfate. So if you imagine, I was going to give my patient magnesium, but it got mixed up, and I gave him morphine instead. They might like it, but. Maybe not, right? Maybe very inappropriate in those cases there. So we, we make sure we write out things instead of just trying to use uh, inappropriate abbreviations. On the script assignment, you'll see there's a, a list of non-approved um, uh, acronyms or abbreviations I put on there. Um, that is by the Joint Commission. Anyone know who they are? JCO, like the dreaded JCO. Why are they so bad? <laughs> if they fail your hospital, you basically uh, don't get funding from CMS anymore. And you get no Medicare or Medicaid funding, and guess what? Your hospital goes broke, basically. Um, you don't want to do that, right? No one's going to reimburse you for your insurance stuff. Um, so Joint Commission, when they say something in terms of safety, generally the hospitals follow it, and generally you should follow it, too. It's generally pretty good practice there. And so, again, don't use any of those non-approved abbreviations. You'll keep yourself out of trouble. Um, other things, right? Make sure you're including um, the strength and the dosage forms there. So make sure you're writing out, you know, 500 milligram tablets uh, because there can be so many different types of dosage forms depending on the drug. You want to make sure you keep it specific. Okay. Um, don't write teaspoon or tablespoon. We've talked about that already. Just use ML. Right? It's going to be very specific for that. And again, dosing syringes are now kind of the norm. So you don't have to worry about patients that have really using spoons anymore. Um, Make sure the quantity of the drug is going to be there. So again, basically just calculate that out by how many ever uh, dosage forms they need per day times the duration. So again, if it's two tabs, you know, say one tab twice daily for 10 days, the quantity should be 20, right? So we make sure that the math is right, and that way I can double check it as the as the pharmacist to make sure everything looks good from that standpoint. Okay. Now, um, one thing we mentioned. So when did generic drugs come out? Yeah, once the patent for the, the brain name drug runs out, and that patent lasts for 20 years, as we mentioned. Um, now, normally as a pharmacist, I can sub out the generic form, even if you write for the brand name form, right? Why do we do that? It's cost savings for the patient, right? It's part of that kind of that fidelity we have to the patient um, to help get their drugs for cheap, essentially. Um, the way you can get around that, if you really, really want to make sure they get just the brand, you can actually write dispense as written on there. Or if you write DAW, then I am bound by that instruction to only fill it with the brand name drug. It's not done frequently, but every once in a while you'll, you'll sometimes have a need for that. Um, say, for instance, a patient uh, has a bad reaction to a generic because it has a, maybe a dye they're allergic to or something, and you just want them to get the brand name, you can do that potentially. Okay. Here's a list of abbreviations um, you may want to avoid just because they can be misread. And again, I posted that on the uh, the assignment as well. So you can check that out. Make sure you don't use any of those. Okay. I'm not going to go through each and every one of them because we don't have time for that probably. Doesn't look like it. Okay. So some other common errors you may run, uh, run into. So um, saying take as directed is um, can be very ambiguous in some cases there. You use it sparingly, right? So there's some indications where it is appropriate, especially if it's a complicated dosing that is... Um, basically handled by the dosage form itself. So here's an example of a methyl prednisolone dose pack. You've probably heard of like a solumedrol dose pack or a medrol dose pack. This is basically what it looks like. And so it's very easy because it tells you right there to take, okay, take six tabs on day one, then five, four, three, two, one. Having to write that out in your script can be a little cumbersome. In that case, it'd be okay to write, use it directed, right? Otherwise, though, you want to make sure you have explicit instructions on your script because whatever you write on that script goes on the patient's bottle, and that's what they're going to be going off of when actually taking the meds. Okay, so you want to make sure you're being explicit, and they can still refer back to that. Um, drugs that have different dosage forms, you want to be careful of. So, for instance, and this is kind of going back to, like, my emergency medicine roots here, uh, but frequently if, like, you're in the middle of a code or something, they say, give an amp of calcium or give an amp of bicarb. You know what an amp is? An ampule, right? An ampule is actually a glass. You can look up a picture of it. Basically, it's like a glass vial that you have to break off the top of it and try not to cut yourself in the middle of a code. That was very embarrassing if you do that. Um, you get the drug out. Very infrequently do you use ampules anymore anyway. So it's kind of a, um, an old, like kind of a term that isn't really applicable to our purposes anymore. The reason why this is dangerous if you say you're in a code situation, patients in cardiac arrest and they need a calcium right now, um, there's actually two forms of calcium there. They both come in a one gram vial. They're both 10 mLs, but they're different salt formulations. One's calcium chloride, one's calcium gluconate. Now, what, does this matter which one I give? It does, because if, if you look at the elemental amount of calcium, there's three times as much in the calcium chloride as there is in the calcium gluconate. You know why that is? Because they're both 10%, they're both one gram. 
Hmm? No, it has to do with the glucose. It's just a bigger molecule than the chloride, right? So again, for that same gram, you get more calcium in there than you would the calcium gluconate because of the size of the molecule itself, right? So three times as much calcium. So if you just say give an amp of calcium and the nurse doesn't know what you mean, they may give either one and you either get a triple dose of what you expected or only a third of the dose. Again, that's an error. So you want to avoid those. Uh, if you ever hear give an amp of bicarb, this is another big one that can be an error because looking at this, there's two concentrations that are commonly kept in the ER. There's an 8.4% and a 4.2%. One's made for infants, one's made for uh, adults. One comes as a 50 ml syringe, right? This adult one does, and it's one mil equivalent of bicarb per ml. This one is half of that, basically 0.5 mil equivalents per ml, and it's only five or a 10 ml syringe. So if you say give an amp of bicarb for an infant, and I give the wrong one, they're getting way, way too much bicarb, right? Or if the flip happened, again, is, is every nurse you're going to deal with going to be like super on it and super smart and wonderful and brilliant and beautiful? No, unfortunately. <laughs> There's some very handsome men out there too, okay? I'm just saying. <laughs> Point being is that you're going to sometimes be dealing with like newbie nurses, right? Just like you're going to be a newbie PA one day. Um, and you say anything, they're going to just follow that direction, right? So you can say, please light yourself on fire. They're like, okay, I'm going <laughs> to... Um, it's okay, right? Everyone starts somewhere, right? Everyone's going to learn at some point. Um, but if you say give an amp of bicarb, the first one they pick up, maybe the first one the patient gets. And that could be a big error there, okay? So if you give this infant one to an adult, it's not going to be near enough bicarb. So it can kind of go either way depending on the situation, right? So um, not being very specific with your unit. So as an example, start the patient on 20 of dopamine. 20 of what? 20 milligrams per hour, likes per kilo per minute, 20 ducks. I don't know, right? You got to be very specific when you're when you're mentioning these things. I've seen cases where an entire bottle of nitroglycerin got infused into a patient because the nurse uh, did not get proper instructions on the units and ran it in instead of uh, micrograms per minute. It was in mics per kilo per minute. It was a pretty big guy, and so I ended up running the whole vial in uh, basically over you know, five ten minutes. Got a whopping headache, but otherwise it was okay. But again, that's a big medical error. These are things you have to think about. So be very clear with your instructions, otherwise. Ambiguity is going to cause issues. Okay. Um, looking at inappropriate do uh, drug prescriptions, again, you need to be cognizant of other contraindications or interactions. So always get a full medication history before you're prescribing something new and know how that's going to interact with their current med list, right? And again, make sure you're asking about things like OTC stuff, ask about herbal stuff. Otherwise, it may not be you know, uh, that open up to, to telling you about it unless you ask specifically. Um, in some cases, drugs cannot just be given together because they are physiochemically incompatible. If you put calcium and phosphorus in the same line, they precipitate out and they can either ruin that line or actually cause an embolus in the patient, right? You don't know that, but this is where we have a lot of resources to help us out determine these things there. Um, then also think about disease state interactions. If you're giving a diuretic to a patient with volume overload, think about the electrolyte abnormalities that can cause for them. You think about all the different problems that can happen there. And you'll learn about these as we go for, uh, through form one and two. Okay, um, so then compliance here, there's a, a couple things I want to talk about in terms of compliance. Um, again, this is going to be how well your patients actually follow your instructions here. Um, there's kind of four types of compliance issues you can run into. One is where the patient doesn't actually obtain the medication. One where they're not uh, taking it as they're prescribed. One where they prematurely discontinue the medication or one where they take it inappropriately. I'm going to kind of, kind of talk about different examples of this in a second here. Um, now, a lot of patients fail to have their prescriptions filled. Why do you think that is the case? The money for it. What else? Maybe a drug shortage, can't get access to it. It's too busy. I mean, the pharmacy is so far away, and it's already, it's already 6 p.m. I don't feel like going out again. A lot of reasons why that may not happen, right? Um, so you have to be careful with that. Um, sometimes if you write for a nice, like, compounded prescription that is not commercially available, they have to go to a compounding pharmacy. And that's awesome, a hassle, and it, it can be expensive, right? On um, time of day, for a while, back when and you guys are familiar with, like, the Lake Nona area, like Nemours and, and UCF uh, Med School and the VA and all that. So that's a... Um, a kind of an up-and-coming developing area. When I first moved there in 2012, we were trying to open up Nemours. It was basically like Nemours and then like cow fields like everywhere. And now it's actually developed. There's a lot of cool stuff there. Um, unfortunately, when we first opened up the ER, we were like, okay, here's your prescription. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. Go fill it somewhere. And guess what? There were no 24-hour pharmacies anywhere to be found within a decent time frame. And a lot of these patients were coming from Disney. So they're from out of town. They don't know where to go to get their meds. And there was a delay there, right? So nowadays we have more open pharmacies, but the question is, is you know, do you have access to, to those things depending on time of day? And that can be important. Um, 
And again, if they have a lack of perception for the need for medication, that may keep them from getting it filled in the first place. I cannot tell you how many times when I did my short stint in retail as an intern, um, I would have patients come in from the ER. They'd have a script for antibiotics and for a tooth infection, and they came, had a script for Lortab for pain. And guess what they would say? I don't need the antibiotics. Just, just give me the Lortab. I'm like, you sure? Yeah, just give me the pain meds. I'm like, all right, buddy. Let's see what's going on here. We fill it, but, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, well, he obviously didn't think he had that bad of a tooth infection, but he certainly wanted the opioids that we were going to be giving him there. So, again, not to jade you people, but just know some people are a little bit more nefarious than others when it comes to getting their meds. Uh, but, again, if they don't think they need it, they may not necessarily uh, go out and get it. Now, if they don't take it as prescribed, there could be a lot of different reasons. I mean, people take things by the wrong route sometimes, the wrong frequency. This is where education is super important. Technique is very important for things like injectables or inhaled meds, so uh, make sure you're educating appropriately by that. And oftentimes, they just may have a compliant or just a comprehension issue. If you tell a patient to take two tabs twice daily, how many tabs are they taking a day? Right, you as college-educated individuals, you say, well, obviously that's four tabs a day. But they may think, okay, well, it's two tabs uh, twice daily. I'll take one in the morning, one at night. Right, it's a medication error. Right, so make sure they explain it back to you how they actually take their meds. Uh, when they discontinue prematurely, frequently, this is with antibiotics, they just don't understand the need to actually continue all the way through. Or if they're having, you know, uh, side effects, I mean, just think, eh, I just don't want to take it. It's not really worth it at that point. Um, and again, one of the things you'll find, especially with like uh, antidepressants, they actually take like up to six weeks before they really kick in and start working. And if you're taking a med for six weeks and you don't see any benefit, you're going to continue it? Maybe not, right? So again, you have to educate on these things. Hey, this isn't going to be a quick fix. It's going to take some time to kick in. Make sure you're aware of that, okay? Um, they're taking it inappropriately. Uh, oftentimes patients will take medications. Um, they may share them with others, especially if there's uh, family members or something that can help them out. It's like, oh yeah, I had some Levaquin from a uh, pneumonia I had a couple of months ago. Here, you take this stuff, right? So they share stuff all the time. Um, and sometimes medication abuse, right? So as I mentioned, that patient who didn't want the antibiotics but just wanted the pain meds, perhaps it was for abuse purposes, right? So who knows? Okay, so briefly about controlled substances, right? So this is really going to be anything that, um, it, it, you know who actually controls controlled substances? Regulates that? It's actually the DEA. So the FDA normally, you know, will kind of regulate prescription drugs. The DEA has a hand in actually making things controlled substances. Um, and so it's a drug enforcement agency. And so you will find that if you want to prescribe controlled substances, you have to actually get a DEA license yourself. Uh, if you're working within a hospital, you can actually control, uh, prescribe controlled substances for your inpatients there. But uh, there's a lot more regulations around these. Why do we care about these? Why are we controlling these? Abuse potential, right? They are potentially habit forming. They're potentially addictive substances. Okay. Um, and so basically, there's five different schedules for these uh, controlled substances. There's class one or schedule one. There's no acceptable medical use. No good possible medical use for them, and they have a high um, uh, high abuse potential, right? Highly addictive is what they're saying. There's Schedule 2, which means there is a currently acceptable medical use, but there's still a very high abuse potential, right? So that's a big difference between Class 1 or Schedule 1 and 2 is that Schedule 1, there's no medical use. Schedule 2, there is, okay? And then you have 3, 4, and 5, and those are uh, falling gradations of abuse potential, 5 kind of being the wimpiest out of the bunch, 3 being more so, but less than 2. Kind of make sense? So the reason why I make... Note of this is because there's a lot of different um, uh, restrictions around the prescription on how you do this. And so, for instance, for uh, controlled substances, you have to make sure the, the full address and the name of the patient is on there to make sure you know who's actually coming in and filling it and they have to prov provide uh, ID to get it filled there. Or if, an, if it's an animal, you have to make sure the species isn't indicated. And I think, why would I be filling controlled substances for an animal? Not pain commonly, but more commonly than not, it's actually seizures. That would be the most common thing I would find is we'd be uh, sending out certain um, uh, like phenobarbital for cats with seizures or dogs with seizures. That was the most common thing I'd run into. Or sometimes pain, but more often than not, they'll usually get insects and stuff. Um, but, yeah, so there could be a reason for that. Anyway, you're treating pay, pay, uh, people, not animals, right? Um, you also want to make sure you have the full address and name of the prescribing practitioner plus the DEA number. You have to have that on there. Otherwise, we're not going to fill it, right? Or we have to call up and get clarification on that. And then you need to have the written and numerical quantity to dispense. So instead of just writing five, they can change it to 50. You have to write actual out F-I-V, right? Make sure you write out textually. Now, Schedule two substances cannot be refilled, right? 
You can write it for a 90 day supply for it, but you cannot write for any refills on it. Even if you did write for refills, we would not honor that. We would just say, okay, you don't get the one time fill there. Now, sometimes what you'll find in it, you know, not all C2 medications are just pain meds. Actually, uh, patients who are on medication for ADHD frequently are on C2s, right? Your Adderalls, your Concertas, things like that. Um, you can write actually for three different scripts, and you can actually um, say, do not fill until. And that way it's nice because that way we don't have to have parents coming back with their kids every every single month for, for a new script. Um, sometimes you can do that, but it's never more than a 90 day supply. Okay. And they also have to be written on tamper evident paper. So that way you can't you just go and copy a million copies of it. Usually it'll say, you know, um, void if you try to copy it. If you try to alter it, it's going to say, you know, it's, it's a no go from that standpoint. And also they cannot be transmitted over the phone. So for the most part, they need to be handed in via paper from the patient to the pharmacist. Okay. Now, three, fours, and fives, there's a lot less uh, restrictions on those, uh, mainly because um, they feel that there's less abuse potential to them. Um, so those you can actually fill up for a maximum of five refills. So a total of six months worth of drug can be written for. And then after that six months, the prescription is not valid anymore. Normally, a prescription is good for how long? A year. These are going to be for six months. Okay. Again, here's an example of uh, counterfeit evident paper. Again, if you tried to copy this, it was a void all over it. We would know not to fill that, right? Um, again, these are actually given out by specific manufacturers and you have to actually be, have a DA license to get these printed out for you in the first place. It's a very controlled sort of thing there. Um, and these, especially for C2s, have to be handwritten by the, uh, the signatures handwritten by the doc. So very frequently before our PAs could write for controlled substances, um, if you're working in the ER, you'd actually have them write the prescription out and then hand it over to their doc, their attending, and they would actually sign it for them. Okay, So that's another thing you could do potentially. Okay, does anyone know, federally speaking, what schedule morphine is? Schedule two substance, right? There's a high abuse potential, but we do have an acceptable medical use, right? Use as an analgesic. How about cocaine? It's actually a two, interestingly enough. Who would have guessed, right? Anyone know what you use it for? Yeah, sometimes ophthalmologic procedures or ENT procedures because it's a nice anesthetic and it's also a vasoconstrictor, right? We used to carry cocaine over at the Pete's hospital when we first opened up. We had 4% cocaine hydrochloride. It was good stuff. And because um, our ENT docs are like, yeah, we're going to use it, and then they never use it, so we ended up expiring it. Um, but we used to carry it. How about methamphetamine? It's actually a two, right? So any of your amphetamines are going to be uh, Schedule two medications there. How about marijuana? That's a Schedule one substance, okay? Now, this is a weird one because what did I say about the laws in terms of following which one's stricter? You follow federal or state? state? Whichever one is more strict, you typically follow. Marijuana is a weird one because they basically have the federal government saying, we're not going to follow and actually do anything about this for states that have medical use approved or recreational use used. We're not going to come in and do anything. Um, we're going to let the states kind of regulate that. So that's one notable exception. So like in Florida, what can we use it for? Yeah, certain medical uses, right? You have to get your green card and, and all that fun stuff, um, but not just for recreational use, okay? So those are the laws you have to follow there. Um, can PAs prescribe medical marijuana in Florida? Yeah. Negative, you cannot. Yeah, it only has to be uh, certain providers who've been registered, yeah. So anyway, so again, that's kind of a weird one, but that is technically a Schedule One substance. Anyway, sometimes you're going to find that different drugs, and I don't run up on time, um, different drugs will have different um, uh, control, different schedules. So as an example, we found that the drug Carisoprodol, which is a muscle relaxant, uh, we found a lot of abuse with, with it. And so in Florida, we actually made it a C4. In other states, you may find it's not controlled at all, right? So sometimes it's going to be state-to-state -state regulated. And sometimes schedules can change for things. So as an example, uh, for hydrocodone, which was in Lortab, it used to be the number one prescribed drug in the U.S., until we made it a C2 and then kind of dropped off a little bit because by making it from a C3 to a C2, there's that 90 day restriction on it. It's under a lot more con uh, federal control. And so that actually helps to limit how much we're actually sending out of it. Um, so we starting to see some trends lowering uh, that amount that we're sending out there. Tramadol also used to be a non-scheduled medication. It's kind of a weak, kind of wimpy opiate, but enough people were abusing it. They said, hey, let's go ahead and make it a C4. Okay, so those changes can happen over time. So any questions? on that section. So this is the end of the testing material. This is enough to get you through your prescription assignment as well, which is also going to be due. When does that do? Next week? Yeah. Whenever it's due. Make sure it's in. And then let me check to see if there's any questions on the board. Oh boy, I got a whole bunch. Hold on. I know. I know you guys want to get out of here, but this is not Friday. Okay. 
let's see here. Let's say that the doctor told you how to take a medication, but the pharmacy made a different dose of the same medication, and you follow the doctor said uh, instead of the label and had a very bad side effect, hallucination. Would it make the patient more susceptible to that medication because of the overdose that they were on? I'm not quite following that question. Can anyone clarify? I know this is meant to be anonymous. Hey, I'm going to skip that one for right now. Um, how end up, so, so you guys, we'll talk about the test tomorrow when we do the Kahoot review, so just FYI on that. Um, can pharmacists prescribe medications without an order from a doc, uh, PA, and P? If so, under what conditions? Um, technically, no. Um, there are some places, like over in the UK, where there's like a, a third class of medications or kind of like behind the counter drugs that pharmacists can prescribe. But here in Florida, it's not really a thing. We don't really prescribe anything, right? I tell you what to prescribe, but I don't do it myself, right? So that way, if you get in trouble, I'm kind of not, not responsible, right? I'm just kidding. We all share the responsibility there. Uh, is it true that Coca-Cola used to have cocaine in it? Yes, that is true. Uh, when a prescription comes in that seems wrong, i.e. the dog, do you have a responsibility to not fill it? Um, I have a responsibility to clarify. I can refuse to fill anything I want. Um, usually it's not good practice to do so unless I have a pretty good reason for it. Um, you know, there's some people who are like very religious and they won't prescribe like, they won't dispense plan B for instance. Um, again, it just depends on, on the situation, but, um, typically I would try to figure that out. If I didn't know it was a dog, I'd probably call the prescriber. Obviously, if you look on the script, it would say it's a veterinarian that would kind of clue me in a little bit, but. Anyway, um, for drugs with the distribution phase, will the patient have toxi uh, toxicity side effects during that period of time? No, typically, um, you may find a little bit in increased intensity of effects uh, initially, but it takes time for that stuff to partition out to the tissues where the drug really works, so not really. Okay, uh, what would be the high-risk patient? Anyone know what the high-risk patient would be? Yeah, like older patients, uh, a neonate, someone with like poor organ function, someone who's got cancer or maybe they have AIDS. You know, there's lots of different things that classify a patient's high-risk. Situation-dependent, we'll talk about those later on. Uh, and then do I believe in Neosporin? I think so. <laughs> yeah, it works pretty good. I mean, you put it on cuts, antibiotic combinations, three antibiotics, works pretty good. Okay, clarification. Patient was on LDN and had bad effect when, uh, bad effect was supposedly, this would help the condition. Would you try the medication again? LDN. I'm going to get a second clarification on here in just a second. <laughs> oh, gosh. My mind's running a blank right this second. Perhaps come up afterwards and we can clarify if you feel comfortable doing so. Um, otherwise, any other questions? If not, I will see you guys tomorrow bright and early, 8 o'clock.